armholes over her eyes and she's holding scales, right? And so if you think of it in the context of the scales, if this is the plaintiff side of the scale and this is the defendant side of the scale, for the plaintiff to win, plaintiff scale needs to be down here, right? Gotta be heavier, plaintiff's evidence has to be heavier than the defendant's evidence. If, for example, in a classic sexual harassment case where it's um, a female employee alleges that her male supervisor has sexually harassed her, only there were no witnesses because he's done it all behind closed doors. So there are no eyewitnesses. So they go to trial and it's basically the classic he said, she said, right? She said, you, you harassed me? He said, no, I didn't. And there's no other witness to break the tie. In that case, the plaintiff should win or lose? Lose, lose right, because she's got to come, it can't just be dead even. It can't be the plaintiff's word against the supervisor's word. Plaintiff has to come up with some additional evidence. It could be documentary evidence, where she reported the guy and they did a, uh, the HR department did an investigation and found that he had in fact said some nasty things to her that shouldn't have been said. It could be a witness, it can be any number of things, but plaintiff's gotta have a little bit more evidence than defendant because the plaintiff has the burden of proof. She's got to come up with a little bit more proof than the defendant has. Now, this is in a civil case. In a criminal case, it works quite differently. There is no plaintiff in a criminal case. There is only the government, the state government, the parish government, the federal government, that brings charges, criminal charges, against the so-called defendant. So the defendant is accused of armed robbery. The entity that prosecutes that case, that pr tries to prove to the jury that the defendant actually committed that crime, is the state. In Orleans Parish, we talk about it, or in Louisiana, we often talk about it being the district attorney who brings the charges, and lawyers from the district attorney's office stand before the judge and jury and present the evidence against the criminal defendant. So the idea here is the state actually stands in the shoes of all of society or the community, if you want to look at it that way. So it is society, it is the community, it is everybody who is not accused of a crime that the district attorney actually represents in trying to convict the accused of whatever crime it is he or she is charged with. To win their case, to put that person in jail, the state has to prove its case, <coughs> what's the phrase, beyond? A reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt, right, with emphasis on the word reasonable. Because it doesn't mean without any doubt, but it has to be without a reasonable doubt. The word reasonable is like used and used and used and overused in the law, and most of us sort of pretend we know exactly what it means, but it really has um, variable meanings depending on how it's used. Uh, when we get to the contracts chapters, you're gonna hear me talking about reasonable person standard. Here, reasonable means you should vote to convict a person unless you have, it doesn't have to be an enormous amount of doubt, but you gotta have more doubt about the person's guilt than you do believe that he's guilty. In your own mind, if you're on the jury, you should have more doubt about his guilt than you have conviction that he is guilty. Okay, and that's basically the way that works. And the reason, this is a much harder standard for the state to meet than this. And the reason for that is, because in a criminal matter, what's at stake is not just money, and it's not even often money, but it is someone's liberty, someone's freedom, and or in a death case, someone's life, potentially. So the burden of proof must be higher, because we're talking about the penalty 
but if the person is convicted, they're going to be incarcerated. Or, <coughs> again, a death penalty case, potentially executed. That's a lot more serious than telling somebody you've got to pay some money. So, of course, the burden of proof is much higher on the government in a criminal case. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so we'll talk about civil versus common law. Here, what we mean, there are two major um, bodies of law, if you will, that one of the two of them usually applies in almost every country, with the exception these days of um, those countries that um, are predominantly Muslim and follow uh, Sharia law. There are a few such nations out there. And there may be a few other smaller nations that follow some other system of law that is not Sharia, that is not civil, and that is not common. But the vast number of countries in the world fall either into common law or civil law. And here's the difference. The common law is law derived from merry old England, from back in the 1300s and 1400s. Common law generally refers to a system of law where most of the laws are made not by a legislative body, but in fact by judges and courts and cases that are brought before them. So in a common law system, the way we say it is, in a common law system, the primary or number one source of law is case law. Decisions in cases rendered by judges. And any country that was ever part of the British Empire including the United States of America, are common law jurisdictions. Because again, there was, based on 13th and 14th century English system of law. So I say the US is a common law jurisdiction. It is, with one exception. Who's that? Louisiana. Louisiana law is based on what system? so-called Napoleonic Code, obviously French law. So the primary source of law, again, in common law countries, is case law, decisions rendered by judges. The primary source of law in civil law countries is, in fact, the Code of Statutes. So the French system placed greatest emphasis on laws passed by legislative bodies, like in our world Congress or the state legislature. <coughs> so when we say primary source, we don't mean, I don't mean, that if you're a common law country, you can only look to cases decided by judges. No, what primary means is that is the first source of law that you have to go to to see if there is anything in the case law of that country that helps you figure out or answer the issues raised in the particular case in front of you. In a civil law jurisdiction, the first place lawyers have to go to find out, and judges, to find out what the applicable principle of law is, what law applies to the facts of this case, right? That's the inquiry. In a civil law country, you first have to look to the legislative laws, laws passed by a legislative body. If you either don't find the rule of law that applies to the facts of your case in the statute, in the code, which is just a book of statutes, you are then free to go research the issue in case law, in administrative regulation, under the Constitution. And the same is true for common law jurisdictions. You have to start looking for the answer in case law. But if you don't find it there, or even if you do find it there,
there, you may then go and look also to statutory law in those jurisdictions. So it's not a question of case law is the exclusive body of law in a common law jurisdiction, or statutes are the exclusive law in a civil law jurisdiction. They're just the primary one. So you have to go to your first. If you don't find your answer, or even if you do, thereafter you can refer to or you can look into other sources of law. And Louisiana is the only civil law state in the United States. The other 49 states are all common law because, as you know, the original 13 colonies that became the original 13 United States of America were, had been part of the British Empire until the American Revolution was fought and won. Louisiana, on the other hand, was settled long before the American Revolution. Louisiana was settled by the French, and then the Spanish, and then the French, and then the Spanish, and it kind of went back and forth like that. Until 1803, remember the, uh, the revolution was fought in the late 1770s, and up until about 1783. Um, but Louisiana, New Orleans was founded in 1718. We're about to have our 300th anniversary two years from now. And it was founded again by the French and the Spanish. And it was not until 1803 when Thomas Jefferson purchased from France the so-called Louisiana Territory, which, by the way, if you recall or don't, ran all the way from Minnesota up there at the, what is now Minnesota, up there at the Canadian border, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. We ended up, this state, ended up with the name Louisiana, but all of that territory had been referred to as Louisiana Territory because the French explored it, conquered it, and seized it in the name of King Louis and Queen Anna. And that's how that came about. So again, Louis the French law was like entrenched in Louisiana long before the revolution was fought, 50 years or more before the revolution was fought, okay? And that legacy, that heritage of French and Spanish law is what has stayed with us, which is why we remain to this day the only civil law jurisdiction in this ocean of common law states, which has made things a little dicey from time to time in the context of doing business because there are different concepts in the French law and the English law. And I don't mean just different rules, I mean different ways of looking at and framing legal questions from everything having to do with property law to personal injury law to responsibilities of neighbors to make sure that their dogs and their children don't tear up other people's property. They, they were looked at quite differently. And there's a wealth of you know old French treatises and um, that sort of thing that really lay out the history of French law, which goes really way far back. So today, common law jurisdictions, as I said, are um, countries, or in our case, states, that were once part of the British Empire. So uh, we're talking Canada, um, Australia, New Zealand, India, the whole United Kingdom, of course, um, a variety of Caribbean islands, uh, a couple of African countries, um, and so on and so forth. The rest of the world, the largest number of countries, fall into the civil law category. So Louisiana is an extreme minority in the US, but we are in the majority type of legal system if you look at the rest of the world. Almost all of Europe is in the civil law tradition, a lot of Eastern Europe as well, um, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty much how that stuff breaks down. And these are, like I said, this is the main difference. But in Louisiana, the common law has made a lot of inroads into the civil law, simply because we find ourselves, as I said, this isolated island of civil law, French law, in a big old ocean of English law. So you'll see when we get to the contracts chapter, the big ways down the road here, um, there's, there's a requirement in the common law jurisdictions in order to have a valid contract, there are four requirements that have to be present, one of which is called consideration. 
We don't have that in the civil law. The civil law speaks not at all of consideration. And all that consideration means is if you and I enter into a contract, and for the contract to be valid, for the courts to enforce it, if we have to sue each other if things go badly, um, each of us has to have obtained or received something of value from the other under the terms of the contract, or the contract's no good. In Louisiana, so what that means is a contract, a promise to make a gift, I promise to give you $50,000 just because, and I don't ask you to do anything in exchange for that. So what I've done is promise to make you a gift. I'm giving you a present, right? I'm making you a donation. In the other 49 states, when I back out of that promise, as you know I'm going to do, right? I was in every state except for four of them, apparently. So you know I'm going to back out. In the other 49 say, states, you can sue me. And if the court believes that I legitimately made that promise, the courts in the other 49 states are going to say that I made the promise, but I didn't get, I wasn't getting anything in return for it. So in the other 49 states, I win the lawsuit and I don't have to, I don't have to fulfill the promise. In Louisiana, however, I don't care about consideration. If I'm stupid enough to make a promise, like I'm gonna give you $50,000 and you don't have to do anything for it. As long as I'm not like crazy or drunk out of my brain or something when I make that promise, you can take me to court and the court will say, why did you do that? And I, and, and the person, I made the promise to you. You say, well, what she told me was, she had a lot of money, didn't know what to do with it, doesn't have any kids, um, you know, and she wanted to help me out to finish my education. The court looks at me and goes, you said that? And I'm like, mm, yeah. Pay up, pay up. A promise to make a gift is enforceable in the civil law jurisdiction. It is not enforceable in the common law jurisdiction. That is a major difference in the law, if you think of it. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about systems are, um, are quite different in certain areas, but because we sit in the middle of this common law country, common law concepts like even consideration of a contract have made, have sort of invaded Louisiana law as well. Um, it's not a requirement, but the court cases in breach of contract cases talk about consideration. <coughs> And that, again, that's just because we are where we are. We're surrounded by states where that's an important issue in contract law. So back in England, um, the courts were really separated into <coughs> two different sets. There were some courts that you went to if you lived in medieval England. If you were gonna sue somebody for money or damages, you went to one set of court because money or damages is called a legal remedy. But you went to another set of courts if what you were seeking in your lawsuit was not money, but some other remedy that has to do with fairness. So a legal remedy is nothing more than the plaintiff who is suing the defendant is seeking money or damages. An equitable remedy is when, so let's, did I use the dog too enough to think thing with you guys last week? No, okay, so let's take a, a very simple kind of nuisance case. Um, I have a neighbor that has a big massive German Shepherd. And that German Shepherd has the toughest <coughs> teeth anywhere around. The canine, um, teeth like you've never seen and he loves to gnaw on the wooden fence that separates my yard from your yard. The dog is doing it. The dog is constantly destroying portions of the fence. So for a while I kind of put up with it. I paid to have it fixed. Didn't want to make a bad neighbor so I didn't complain to you. But like after the second time I ring your doorbell and I'm like okay so look we gotta do something about this dog right because uh, I can't keep putting up new portions of the fence every couple of weeks because the dog just likes to chew on wood. So what can we do? And you go, you could go back to your house and not bother me again. A 
dog is a dog and it likes to chew. What do you want me to do? Okay, well, I'm going to file a lawsuit in that case because you're not going to cooperate. In the lawsuit, I do want money because I want the judge to make you pay me this time to have the fence repaired. But what I want even more than money to make the repairs is I want the judge to order you to do what? <laughs> no, not kill it, for God's sake. Right, y'all went to the extreme. That may be what I want, but that ain't what I'm going to get. What I'm going to get is, what I'm going to ask the judge for, is for the judge to order you to prevent your dog from chewing on my fence. Now, how do you do that? Well, it basically means when you're not home to supervise the dog, you can't let the dog out of the door, unless you put a muzzle on the stupid thing, right? So it stops chomping on my fence. I don't, if I, I'm paying for the fence, you may be my neighbor, but your dog doesn't have the right to destroy my property, nor do your children, nor do my children or my dog have the right to destroy your property, because we, as parents of the children or owners of the dog, are under the law responsible for the actions of those whose lives we control. That's kids and dogs, right? Sometimes the same thing. So. I want the judge to order you to take action that will prevent the dog from chewing up my fence, whether that's, sorry, but chaining your dog up if you have to leave him in the yard when you're not home, putting a muzzle on the dog, not good, in the hot summer, got to be able to drink, right? Or keep the dog inside, unless you are home so that you can be out in the backyard with the dog and make sure that if he starts, starts chomping on my fence, you tell him, knock it off. And this doesn't happen anymore. So that kind of remedy, that remedy has nothing to do with money, right? Mm -hmm. I want the judge to order your dog, to order you to stop letting your dog tear up my property. So that is what we call an equitable remedy. Equitable means fair. It, it has less to do with money and more to do with what is fair. What's fair? What's the right thing to do? What's the just thing to do? So. The remedy, the type of equitable remedy I just described to you is what we call an injunction. Another type of equitable remedy is what we call specific performance of a contract. I'm going to go back over these in a minute. And another type of equitable remedy, so none of these has anything to do with the payment of money, is rescission and restitution under a contract. So 